recording. If you do have a suggestion or a comment, feel free to put it in the uh, in the chat. That's fine too. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna start out. Let me get back to this PowerPoint. We're gonna start out talking about solubility. We've talked about boiling point and boiling point and how the surface area of a molecule affects that and how the different intermolecular forces affect that. So now we want to talk about a little bit about um, solubility because that's also a physical property, right? So you can see here, and this is also in the, the video, uh, when you dissolve something, right, what you're doing is taking more than likely a, a solid and adding, a, adding it to a liquid and then what happens is the liquid starts, the, the molecules of the liquid start interacting with that thing that you dissolve, right? So the solute interacts with the solvent and that's how something is. A lot of times we confuse um, <laughs> uh, something dissolving with something melting. Something melting is totally different than it dissolving. I hear people say that all the time too, right? If you add water to salt or add salt to water, or uh, add some other uh, solid to water, the solid is not melting. What it's doing is dispersing and interacting with the molecules of water that's around it. That's what you see here. So you get all these little interactions between what is being dissolved, which is the solute, and what is uh, what the solvent is. <laughs> so the solvent is your medium, and then the solute is what is being dissolved, all right? So when you think about that, the solute solvent, there's a there's a um, there's an axiom that you can always remember for or, for organic molecules and and how they dissolve, right? And that is like dissolves like. Let me write that somewhere. I'm gonna write it right here. All right. So like dissolves like. What that means is simple. If, if a molecule is, hot, is very polarized, then it's only going to dissolve in a polar solvent. If it's nonpolar, then it's only going to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. Right. So it's a little bit different uh, than taking a, a salt and dissolving it up in water. Right. Because you have certain rules that you have to kind of abide by. So always remember this: light dissolves light. Right. That's that's the that's the that's a key axiom in organic. If you're trying to dissolve uh, some type of compound, so it, here you got you have some different uh, different types of solvents, right? So you got a polar salt, polar non-organic solvent, which is water. It's only the only reason it's considered non-organic is because it doesn't have carbon in it, right? So non-polar organic solvents here carbon tetrachloride, and then hexane. Hexane is just a six carbon chain, and then carbon tetrachloride is exactly what it sounds like, a carbon with four chlorines attached to it. Those are very nonpolar solvents, and so they dissolve nonpolar organic molecules, right? What, what would be an example of, of an organic molecule that's polar? Like water. That's it. So besides water, besides water, give me an example of a of a molecule that you. So let me let me back up. What 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 creates polarity in a molecule? Let's think about that. What creates polarity? What have we already studied <clears throat> that we can say that polarity comes from? A difference in electronegativity. Electronegativity negativity differences, which means that molecules that have uh, dipoles, some type of dipole, right? 
they, those are going to be considered polar, right? So if I have something like, uh, if I have something like, uh, let's see. Right, two two fluorobutane. Would that be considered polar or nonpolar? Right, you have a highly polarized carbon fluorine bond in it. Right, so something like this would be considered polar. Right, if I have something like uh, two three dimethyl pentane. Right, something like that would be considered nonpolar. Right, so the types of molecules that you're trying to trying to dissolve are always going to depend on whether or not some type of dipole is present. Sorry about that. Right, so you have polar types of compounds and nonpolar types of compounds. So your polar organic solvents are here. Right, alcohols are polar because of the OH and because of the CO bond. There's a dipole there. Uh, acetone. Let me show you what these look like. By the way, I'm going to draw them over here, so don't confuse it by thinking I'm calling them nonpolar because I'm not. I'm just drawing them over here for space. Right. So acetone would look like this. Right, so that's acetone, ethyl acetate. Look, it's an ester. All right, looks like that. <clears throat> All right, um, any carbonyl containing solvents like acetic acid or. Uh, uh, triplic acid, any type of acid, any type of alcohol is going to be considered a polar, a polar organic salt. Right, so this type of stuff here is memory. This is not uh, something that, you know, you, 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 you can memorize the types of organic solvents, whether they be nonpolar or polar. And then water is always going to be polar as well. Right, so let's look down here. You can see here, water is polar. Carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, right? And if you try to dissolve up, say, butane in carbon tetrachloride, butane is nonpolar. It doesn't have any functional groups within it that cause a dipole, right? A real dipole, not a micro dipole like we talked about with those Van der Waals uh, interactions. So that's nonpolar. You're going to dissolve that up in, some, in a solvent that's nonpolar. Right, and then for acetone, acetone is polar. And if you want to dissolve that up, you want to dissolve that up in something that's polar. So in this case, water is polar. Carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. All right, any questions about that? <laughs> We're going to do some other examples too. So just you know, don't panic. Any questions about anything so far? All right, so let's look at, uh, let's talk about some other aspects of, of solubility, right? So something to, for something to be soluble in water, if you watch that video, tell me what the criteria uh, are for being soluble in water. Didn't it say that it had to be, have like five carbons and like, right one um atom that's like either n o or f yes so you need a you you need to have a 5 to 1 ratio of carbons to hydrogen bonding atoms that's how you determine if something is is soluble in water can't spell soluble it's friday Right, so in order to determine if something is soluble in water, 
you have to have this ratio. Not let me, based on my experience in teaching this, people always get this confused. Well, what if it has four carbons and one hydrogen bond in there? That falls into the ratio. What if it has three carbons? It still falls into the ratio. If it has six carbons, then you're gonna to have to have another hydrogen bond in there, right? So from, from one to five carbons and one hydrogen bonding atom, it's soluble in water. From uh, five to 10, you need, well, from six to 10 carbon atoms, you need two hydrogen bonding atoms. Are you following that? Yes, sir. From 11 to 15, you're gonna need three hydrogen bonding atoms. So as you increase the number of carbons, you also have to increase the number of hydrogen bonding atoms for something to be soluble in, in water. All right, so let's look at these two examples. <laughs> and then we're gonna look back at the handout that we were working on the other day, All right? So here's a, here's a uh, ethanol, which has two carbons. Can you see that? You got two carbons here. And then you have your one hydrogen bonding atom, which is oxygen, All right? Your hydrogen bonding atoms are N, O, and F. Right, those are the three atoms that need to be present in any molecule, and the ratio of five to one must be must be met, or something in that in that range has to be met in order for it to be soluble in water. So ethanol has how many carbons? Two. Two carbons and ethanol, and then how many hydrogen bonding atoms does it have? One. One. I'm going to abbreviate this as just HBA, hydrogen bonding atoms. So would that be soluble in water? Yes or no? Keep in mind, this is what the ratio I'm trying to meet. It can be five or less. Yes. It should be, it should be soluble. Is that right? It's got two carbons and one hydrogen bonding atom. It should be very soluble in water. Now you look at cholesterol and you can kind of think about, uh, cholesterol in terms of, have you ever tried to uh, wash dishes and you cook like something, maybe you made like an egg with some olive oil in the skillet or something like that and you just ran water in there, right? All of those types of fats and cholesterols and things like that are insoluble in water. You have to make them soluble. That's why you have to add some soap because the soap has what's called surfactants and they bind to the uh, hydrogen bonding atoms and pull the fats and the oils and things like that into the water. But the only way for that to happen is for you to do something like that. Otherwise, something like this is not gonna be soluble, right? Look at the number of carbons. I'm not gonna count them, I'm just gonna highlight them. Got here, 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 here. That's a lot of carbons, right? And then how many hydrogen bonding atoms do you have? Just one. Just one, right? Just one hydrogen bonding atom and you got 10, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, to one, carbons to H, hydrogen bonding atoms, right? That's, that's not gonna be soluble. You got five times as many carbons as you would, uh, that, that, that should be present, five times as many. Well, how many oxygens would you have to have on cholesterol to make it soluble? Five. Five. That's exactly right. Because the ratio is at a minimum five carbons to one hydrogen bonding atom. So if you got 25 carbons, you need five hydrogen bonding atoms. Anybody not catching that? Say something. I know it's Friday and Labor Day weekend. Y'all ready to go and eat some Lysol barbecue, but say so. All right. Let's look at a, a, a couple of examples on the handout. Is it? Let me go and find 
was the question. Yeah, here. I know I thought I had a question on here about solubility. That's all right. We'll we'll go up here. I'm going to erase this these functional groups. Tell me, let's look at that first example. And the question we're asking is, uh, which are soluble in water? All right, let's look at the first one. Would this be water soluble? What do you have to do in order to determine that? You need to count the carbons and count the hydrogen bonding atoms. How many hydrogen, and keep in mind, the hydrogen bonding atoms, again, are N, O, and F. You gotta have one of those present, and then for every one of those, you can have up to five carbons. All right, so how many, how many hydrogen bonding atoms do we have in that first molecule? Three. 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 Good. One here, one here, and one here. And then how many carbons? Let's see if we can count these up. Six in the ring. So that's six, seven, eight. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I got eight carbons and three hydrogen bonding atoms. Yes or no? Soluble in water. No, no. I need a buzz. Yes. How many carbons can I have? So it's five to one, right? So that would be if, if I had three hydrogen bonding atoms, I could have up to 15 carbons. Yes or no? Yes, I see you now. Yeah, I, my, my ratio is five to one, but I can have anywhere from one to five carbons for every one hydrogen bonding atoms. So if I have three hydrogen bonding atoms, I can have up to 15 carbons present and it'll still be water soluble. Is that, is that clear? I'm sorry, can you explain one more time? Yeah, so if, I, if my ratio for water solubility is five to one, were you with me on that? Yes, sir. Five carbons, so one hydrogen bonding atom for every five carbons. Right? So if I have two hydrogen bonding atoms, I can have up to 10 carbons. If I have three hydrogen bonding atoms, I can have up to 15 carbons. Okay, I got it, I got it. So <laughs> now here I, I got three hydrogen bonding atoms and eight carbons, so it falls into that ratio. Yes, but if it was more than 15, then it wouldn't. And it wouldn't, exactly. That's right, exactly thanks. Right. All right, let's do the next one. All right, so how many, let's find the hydrogen bonding atoms first. How many do we have? We got our oxygen here, one here and one here. So we got three hydrogen bonding atoms there, yes? And then we have, use a different color. We got six carbons in the ring, Two, that's eight nine, 10 carbons. So we have the ratio here is 10 to three. What you think? Yes. It is. It is. What can that number of carbons be if I got that many hydrogen bonding atoms? Up to 15. Up to 15. <laughs> Anything from one all the way up to 15, if I got three hydrogen bonding atoms, it's gonna fit. It's gonna be soluble. What about this? This is actually aspirin. I want to say this is uh, it's acetaminophen, I think, or phenacetin. It's a derivative of acetaminophen, which is in Tylenol. Actually, no, this is acetaminophen, and this is phenacetin. 
So this is this is Tylenol. That's the structure for the active ingredient. Of course, you got a bunch of other stuff in it, other binders and stuff to make hold it in pill form, and it's all that. Um, but what about that? How many hydrogen bonding atoms do I have there? Four. Four. And then I got six carbons in the ring, and nine carbons. So it's, the ratio here is nine to four. Water soluble or not? Yes. It is, right? How many carbons can I have maximum? Up to 20. Up to 20. Good, good, good. I can have up to 20 carbons. If I have four hydrogen bonding atoms, I can have up to 20 carbons. Are we okay with that? Yes. All right, good. All right, let's see. I had some other questions about water solubility somewhere up here. Let's see. Acidity. I could have sworn I had some other questions, but that may be on a different handout. Let me let me let me do something right quick. Uh, give me one second. Let me look at uh, the handouts for this sec for one uh, A. It may be on a different handout in there, or not. I know it's on the on the pre-assessment, I mean the post-assessment. So at this point, I know you didn't take the post-assessment for 1A or the quizzes, but at this point, you can take them because you all the information that's there, we've already discussed it in, in, uh, in some form. Actually, I'm going to open up the post-assessment. Let me see. How many people we got logged in? Thirty-two. That's good. Okay, I see. That's a good a good suggestion. He says, introduce you to the topics that are introduced in the videos. Well, that's kind of what we're doing. Like every, the videos are just a precursor to what we do in class. Um, but I, I will take that into consideration. Well, thank you for for putting that in the chat. Uh, I'm looking for them. Dr. Russell. Yes. Um, I remember you said you were going to clear the grades because I had took the quiz before now, the functional group pop quiz. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, uh, open up the grade book because I don't have anything graded, so ain't no numbers in there. Give me one second. Uh, who was that speaking? Bria. Bria. Oh yeah, you did. You emailed me the other day too. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Was it uh, which quiz was it? The this post assessment. The pop quiz functional group identification. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Find it first. Functional. Here it is, right here. Pre assessment. Post assessment. I'll find Oh, here it is, right here. I mean, let me clear, I'll clear it out. Right. Sorry about that. I was supposed to do this the other day. All right, let me open up the uh, actual post assessment in 1A and, and let's look, let's see if we can walk through this.
13 questions. All right, great, perfect. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna take it instead of showing you the answers because that's kind of cheating, even though it's not worth a lot. It's just the idea. So which of the following will be soluble in water? That's the question. Uh, first question on this post assessment. And what do you need for something to be soluble in water? Hydrogen bond. Hold up, I need to share. I ain't even sharing the screen. You need a you need a a ratio of what five to one, right? Yes. I'm writing with my mouse, so that's carbon to what? Hydrogen bonding atoms. So which one is soluble in water? Which one can we rule out? Can we rule this out? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't have a hydrogen bonding atom, right? Hydrogen bonding atom is N, O, or F, right? So that's what we're looking for. So we rule out that and that. Is that right? Right. So what we're left with is this molecule and this one. So now it's just a matter of figuring out if the ratio holds. So we got one, two, three, four, five carbons and one nitrogen. Does that match the ratio? Yes. Yeah. What about this one? We got a hydrogen bonding atom here, oxygen, but we have one, two, three, well, we have eight carbons. Four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. So this is eight to one. Is that right? Yes, yeah, but that's not gonna work. Yeah, it won't work. So that's not soluble, that's not soluble, and that's not soluble. Following? It's gotta match this ratio. And it's gotta have one of these three atoms involved. Yes or no? True. All right. Let's go to the next question. Next question says, common axiom uh, for the solubility of organic compounds and organic solvents. What's the, what, what did we just say? Like dissolves like. Like dissolves like, right? That's, that's, so here, I'm gonna go ahead and put the answer in there too. Like dissolves like. Right? What functional group is depicted below? Is it a, and notice you got, mo, you got like the alkenes are here also, but if you look at the answers, it's not asking about that. It's asking about the carbonyl part. So it's either a ketone, an amine, an amide, or a carboxylic acid. Somebody tell me what the difference is between a, a ketone and a carboxylic acid. What is the key, what, what's the key uh, difference or the key characteristic for a ketone functional group? Because all of them are carbonyls, except for, which one can we rule out right away? Carboxylic acid. The acid, you want to rule that out? Why? What should this be right here in order for that to be an acid? A hydroxyl. Hydroxyl group, good, good, good. good. So we rule that out. Uh, what, what should this be in order for this to be a ketone? A carbon. Carbon. Good. Let's rule that out. <laughs> now, the amine and the amide, you know, you can go either way. Yes? Yes. What's, what separates them? The um, oxygen. The carbonyl part. Yep. The amine is going to, it won't have a CO adjacent to the nitrogen. Remember I said something like the amine is not in jail or something like that. It doesn't have a CO but the amide does, so this would, so the amine, we rule that out, right? That means that the correct answer here is the amide. Yes or no? Anybody have any questions about that? All right, so we're gonna say that's the amide. What functional group is this? And if you answer it, tell me why you say, why you give the answer you give. An ester. Okay. 
And I just say that because an ether um, doesn't have that carbonyl group. Right, right, true. And neither would the acid or the ketone, right? Well, the acid and ketone will have the carbonyl, but they, but this group would be different. Yes. All right. And then the amine, you can rule that out because there's no nitrogen present at all. All right. What about uh, here? Amy. Good. I mean, very good. What about here? Aldehyde. It's the aldehyde. Good. And here? The ketone. Ketone. Great. Perfect. All right. Let's look at the next question. Which of the following intramolecular forces is responsible for holding the double helix of DNA together? We just talked about this. Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Great. What's the strongest intermolecular force? Ionic. The ionic one. The ionic attraction or electrostatic attraction. What's the strongest covalent intermolecular force? Hydrogen, Hydrogen bonding. What's the weakest? Van der Waals. Van der Waals. Good. Good. I've been paying attention to studying or something. All right. Uh, what What's the definition of melting point? You should. Everybody should be laughing B. at this question. Turn from a solid to a liquid. Great. And then boiling point. A. Liquids. No. A. C. Is, yeah. A is sub sublimation. Right. It's from a solid straight to a gas, kind of like dry ice. That would be sublimation. For organic compound to be soluble in water, which of the following must be present? D. Good. You need one polarized bond to some to a hydrogen bonding atom for every five carbons. All right. Any questions so far? All right. Uh, it says rank in order of increase in melting point. What are you looking for uh, when you comparing physical properties? Anybody? Or what are we comparing when we comparing physical properties? Aren't we comparing intermolecular forces? Is it like the Go ahead. Who was that? The bonds are right. If we compare. Come on. The interactions. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Uh, I think my Wi Fi cut out or something. Oh, good grief, man. All right. So we're, com we're comparing the intermolecular forces. Is that right? Right. When we're, when we're saying which one's going to melt faster or boil faster or whatever, we're looking at the intermolecular forces. And, and, and that the intermolecular force is from strongest to weakest or weakest to strongest. That's how you know how to order it. When it says increase in melting point, the highest melting point is going to be uh, connected to the molecule that has the what? Strongest or weakest intermolecular force? Strongest. Go ahead. Don't be scared to say it. I heard. I heard. Strongest. Strongest, right? So which one of those uh, has the strongest intermolecular force present? Right? Keep in one. mind. One, right? Because if you've got an OH present, that means this molecule can hydrogen bond to another molecule of itself. Is that right? Right. That's what we're comparing. You got a you got a beaker full of this alcohol. You got a beaker full of this alkane and a beaker full of ketone. You follow me? And you got them all on three different hot plates or all on three different watch glasses, watching them melt. So the alcohol is this is gonna melt 
at the highest temperature? Which one is going to be the lowest temperature? Two. Two. Good. Why? Why is two going to be at the lowest temperature? Horses. Yeah. There's no. Yeah. It just has dipole. Di I mean, uh, Van der Waals. Van der Waals. It's only held together by London forces, Van der Waals forces, right? Whereas three has dipole. So this is dipole hydrogen bonding, and then Van der Waals. So you will rank them in that order. If it's lowest to highest, it's gonna be Van der Waals, dipole, and then hydrogen bonding. Is that, is, is that making sense? Yes, sir. All right. What about the next question? It says rank and order of Decrease in boiling point. Again, you're looking at the animal and intermolecular forces <laughs> between one, three, two. Okay. So this is going to have what the highest boiling point, and then this is going to have the lowest boiling point. That's that's great. And then this would be the same, wouldn't it? It would be no. It would be two, three, one. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. We better get a hundred. Oh yeah. I I think I told you in class like a while back that I did it earlier, so I might have to get it cleared out too. I what I'll I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll add a second attempt. Instead of having to go in and reset everybody, I'll add a second attempt. Let me do that now. Uh That real quick. Uh, let's see here. Post assessment. Edit options. I'll just add, I'll make it uh, two attempts. That way you can just retake it and it'll keep the highest score. Thank you so much. Yeah, it'll keep, I, that way I don't have to go in and keep resetting everybody's stuff. Keep the highest grade. And then if you haven't taken the, the uh, quiz that's in here, you need to take that too. Because right at this point, we talked about everything in these objectives. We talked about resonance. We didn't do stereoisomers because I typically don't teach that until the second part. We did formal charge and then functional groups. And we also did solubility and um, physical properties. All right, uh, so that the quiz that's here, you should be able to take that now. Water solubility and then functional group identification. Now, actually, it's going to be on Friday. <clears throat> Not because we out of class on out of class on Monday. So we'll take that exam too. I'm trying to keep it every two weeks. So we'll take it on Friday. Uh, and it, it'll be the same like the first exam, which will just be on Blackboard. Uh, and it'll only it'll be over the stuff wherever we stop Wednesday. That's what it, that's what'll be on the exam all the way from where we started uh, Monday of this week. We've actually done quite a bit, uh, so it won't be a big exam like fifty questions on it. But <laughs> excuse me. Um, so yeah, are there any questions about the functional groups or any questions about the, what, let me, let me, uh, let me just stop recording because we got 10, we only got 10 minutes.